everyone. I hope you're doing well. I'm Cameron, the Blushing Foreigner. Welcome back to my channel. I look kind of naked right now. I'm wearing this little sundress. I think I've showed it to you guys before in a haul. It's my Mac Studio sundress from Marshalls, which I picked up my last trip home to California. So today I'm going to do part two of the advice video that I posted a couple months ago where I talked about living abroad and all of the events and sort of feelings inside me that preceded my move to Denmark. I moved six years ago and just to do a quick recap of that video I talked about what brought me here and the essence of that is I came for graduate school. I was working on a master's here in Copenhagen at a school outside of Copenhagen called Roskilde University. Ruck and I got a job after that and just stayed in Denmark. So I've been working at the same place for five years. My connection to Denmark was through a good friend who I've known since I was eight or nine years old. She was the au pair for my family when I was a child. And she's Danish, of course, and she lived with us and became basically like a fifth sister. And I'd visited her and her children in Denmark several times and I really liked the place. So when I was thinking about moving abroad, I was talking to Anne Louisa and I was like, where do I go? How do I start? And she's like, just come and live with us. So I was really lucky in that way. I had a connection to the country in you know, a small way. I didn't know many people, but I had her and she was like a sister. So I would encourage you, if you have friends or you know distant relatives, access those ties if you're interested in going to another country. Make friends you know, with people from abroad and they'll set you up with other friends. And I also have a friend who I met through my parents' running club who lives in Torino and he's become a great friend. He and his wife, who's an American, have hosted me several times in their house in Turin. So nurture those relationships. And, and then use those ties as a way of, of, you know, helping yourself if you choose to go abroad. So in that video I told you to ask me any questions, to fire away, and so this video is just to maybe answer some of those questions, some basic things about what it's like living in Copenhagen, what I like, what I don't like, language issues, social issues, all that jazz. I'll try and not prattle on forever. But I do tend to get long-winded and I think of points and I just start rah, firing away with ideas and crazy stuff. So I'm really sorry if this goes off on many tangents. I'll try and stick to the point, which is to encourage you, if you have the desire to go abroad, to just take the chance and to realize that it's within your ability and it's not too hard. It doesn't have to be as complicated as you think it is. So I'll just get right to the questions. Question one was, how did you do it? I'm very worried if I move abroad about not being able to find a job right away and I'd have to rely on my friends for help. How did you do it? I'm a pretty independent person so I thought about that as well. How am I going to make it without a job for a little while? I saved up some money and I got a student loan and I spent the first year and a half just in school. And actually it was the first year alone where I wasn't working. After a year I got my job. I think to get a job you really have to have a persevering mindset. You have to access job resources wherever they are, if it's through a school or your friends or if you find job boards. Um, I was on an email list through an international club and through my university where I just was spammed, you know, 10 times a day with different job postings and a lot of them were for student work, student helpers, part-time stuff but that would lead into full-time stuff. So when I got my job, it was as a part-time worker in a little TV department within an ad agency. And the job posting was all in Danish and I wasn't good at reading Danish, but I just saw two letters, TV, that were my cue that I needed to send my resume in really fast. So I did and I got lucky. They wanted someone with my profile because I had gone to film school in California. So I had something sort of intriguing to them, but you really have to find those little things where you're perhaps going under the radar. You have to sort of exploit the little characteristics in you that are unique to you that no one else has. So if you're from Estonia and you're trying to go somewhere else, use that, leverage your difference and make it a good selling point for another company. Or if you're British and you want to live in California, use that angle and talk about your BBC upbringing and little things like that that would make you a more compelling candidate. So you really need to find what distinguishes you and you need to not be discouraged. I applied for many jobs and I didn't get them. I had some interviews and I'd go in and I'd 
think that I'd rocked it and then I wouldn't get the job and that's just part of the game. It sucks, it's hard, but you have to just keep a positive mindset and say something will come up. The right thing is bound to turn up and if you just look at everything, work really hard and not get discouraged or feel like oh, this is impossible, you know, you're gonna find something. It's just gonna take an effort. Okay, question two. I would like to know more about things in Denmark like food, the grocery store, general everyday things, social life, etc. I love the food in Denmark. That's one part of the culture that I just am quite fond of. I think the eating habits in Denmark are pretty good. They eat a lot of pork and a lot of fat, but there's a lot of fish and lean chicken and protein and vegetables, of course. Uh, rye bread is a big thing here and that's become like a staple part of my diet. I'm gonna lean back you guys, I need to get comfortable. I have my latte here and just having a hugely morning. So yeah, the food is is great. I enjoy eating more like a Dane than I enjoyed eating like a Californian. I think I just have a more relaxed attitude toward food here and I don't deprive myself of anything. I eat whatever I want and I've naturally been able to sort of stay the size, shape, figure, or whatever weight that I have um, just by eating what everyone else eats. They feed us lunch at work, which is great. We, had a, we have our own chef there named Soren, who's amazing. He's a really great chef. He's actually gonna cook for my wedding. And it's just healthy stuff. I mean, he makes great sauces and fish and chicken and beef and hagerbuff sometimes or Burgers on Fridays, once a month we get that, but there's not a lot of candy lying around the office. We don't have a ton of junk food, but if it's there, I'll enjoy it. Uh, and then for breakfast, I'll have rye bread, which is the dark, healthy bread. It's a healthy grain, and it's got a lot of fiber in it. It fills you up, so you're good to go with that in the morning, and then I'm not really hungry till lunch, and then if I need a snack, I'll get that in the afternoon. I'll try and have some fruit or maybe a piece of candy. I don't know, whatever I feel like. And then a pretty modest dinner. I don't cook a lot so I'll have something like smurple which is the open face sandwiches for dinner I enjoy that I'm not usually super hungry in the evening time so I don't know I love eating like a Dane I don't love grocery shopping in Denmark at all and <laughs> there are many reasons for that but it's just not a fun experience shopping for groceries in Denmark I'll explain why if you go to a place like Krikli, Superbus, and just the normal supermarkets on a Thursday, Tuesday evening, 5 o'clock, it is like the wild, wild west in there. People have their carts, and it's just ruthless. People will mow you down. If you hesitate, they are going to go past you. I was in line at the checkout. You have to do everything yourself, by the way. No one's bagging your groceries. You have to hustle. You have to pay and bag at the same time because the person behind you is like on the clock, and he's going to give you attitude if you hold things up. But I stepped out of line for like half a second, just lunging for the, a pack of gum. And the guy behind me goes around me and like cut in my place. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like that is the Danish grocery store. People are just trying to get in and out, be as efficient as they can. And in the process, I believe that they're a little rude. So I don't enjoy grocery shopping here at all. It's not fun. But in general, I much enjoy <laughs> grocery shopping in the US a lot more. Places like Rayleigh's in California, even Albertsons or Ralph's, uh, Whole Foods is amazing. Trader Joe's, I just love that store. I really miss stores like that. Another thing that's really funny about grocery shopping in Denmark, and maybe I'm just weird and you can tell me if you think so, but on a Sunday, the grocery stores are closed. They legislate when businesses are allowed to be open and closed. I don't like that part of Denmark. They're really like up in your business quite a bit. Uh, don't get me started on taxes and things like that. But anyways, businesses cannot be open on a Sunday except for the first Sunday of the month. Um, some department stores and other stores can be open. But if you need to get groceries, there's a store that's like a 24-hour store called Doinetto that's allowed to be open. And there's other, a few other chains that can do that. But if you go to one of those on a Sunday, you will often find that they're out of meat completely or out of eggs or out of milk. And it's just like surreal. You're walking in there and you're like, I'm going to make some nice burgers for dinner. And then you find that there's no meat anywhere, no ground chop, nothing, nothing even, maybe even no chicken. So you're like, are you kidding me? Like, it's just so funny because it's like, this is Denmark and they pride themselves on being the most 
tech savvy, the most innovative, advanced country in the world. And in many ways they are. They're a nation of early adopters. They have like the highest Facebook penetration rate of any country in the world. They have the most users per capita. And all their banking is very state of the art. It's much more efficient in my opinion than the US and they don't have any checks anymore. Everything's done online. You transfer money back and forth to people. But they don't have meat on a Sunday. And it's like, are you kidding me? Like there's so many inconsistencies with that in my head. I'm just laughing like, what are you doing? That's not acceptable. And in the US people would be like, how can a Ralph's be out of milk on any given day of the week? That manager would be fired. <laughs> So I get really high key when I talk about that issue because it's so funny to me. So you have these little enigmas in life and things you'll find when you live abroad where you're like, huh, what is going on? But you just have to not take it seriously. I don't take this too seriously. The fact that I don't like grocery shopping very much and I just try and handle it. So it's part of the charm of living abroad. Okay, question three. Did the school provide you with a visa? They did. The school was extremely helpful and they gave me the form that I needed, it was called the purple form, and I filled it out. It wasn't too complicated, but that was all contingent on me being an enrolled student at the university. So I submitted that form to the Danish Embassy in New York City, I believe, along with my passport, which you hand over, and then they process it. They put your student visa in your passport and send it back to you. That process wasn't difficult. The process of getting my work permit was very difficult. It took about a year and Denmark is known for a lot of things but having a easy immigration system it does not have. Yeah, immigration is a tough issue in this country and I don't have any answers to that but it is not an easy country to immigrate to. They have expectations of foreigners who come and live in their country which are reasonable to a degree. You have to prove that you're gainfully employed or that you're going to get a job. You have to learn the language, you have to take an integration test, you have to do many things. If you marry a Dane, for instance, there's something called family unification, which are rules that are very, very strict and very few people can actually qualify right away. It takes several years of studying Danish to qualify and to be able to pass the language test. So I'm here under my work permit. I was very nervous that getting married to Martin would force me to go under different rules to be in Denmark through family unification through my marriage and thankfully we talked to an attorney and I can stay here under my work permit so as long as I have the company sponsoring me I'm good to go. Question four what is your job in Denmark? I don't feel like there's a huge need for me to keep it a secret what I do I'm not telling you the name of the agency I'm at. I work in advertising. I am in the creative department. It's fun. Advertising is a tough business, but it's a really fun one as well. So if you have dreams of that, I think working in advertising is a wonderful gig, but you have to work your tail off. So be prepared for that. I would love to hear your account of the Danish language. How did you learn it? Whew. Gosh. <sighs> That's a very tough issue and it's a sore subject for me because I'm very bad at Danish and I'm insecure about that and embarrassed at how poor I am at Danish when I've been here for so long. When people ask me, oh, how long have you been there? A lot of Danes will ask me that if I'm meeting like a stranger or someone for the first time, someone at work perhaps who's just started. They shake my hand and they say, oh, how long have you been here? And I just know what's coming next so I tell them six years and then they look at me and they go oh and you're why are we speaking English then and you just get that quizzical look and you're like because I don't know why we're speaking English because I speak English at work and I'm bad at Danish I have a problem where I can actually speak it but I don't understand it when I hear it so I could speak and probably do a video in Danish but when you come back at me in a conversation in Danish, I'll probably only get maybe 20% of it if I'm lucky, maybe 10. Because I don't know what the problem is. I have a hard time separating the words when it's spoken to me. It sounds very like squished together and then I'm always like a few sentences behind so I quickly get lost in a conversation. Okay, a little test of my Danish. Jeg hedder Cameron. Jeg har boet i København i seks år. 
Jeg synes dansk er meget svært. Det er meget svært, fordi mange mennesker taler meget hurtigt og med masse slang. Hvis du kommer fra Norge, eller Sverige, eller Danmark, jeg vil gerne, hvis du skriger til mig nedenfor, hvis du forstår mig. That was fun. That's Danish. It's a really beautiful language, isn't it? Okay, question six. How did you go about setting up a life in Denmark? Like meeting friends and such. When I got here, I joined a bunch of international clubs. I joined some student clubs at the university and then I just looked online and there's these things called meetup groups. So I joined several meetup groups. One was just a general group of internationals living in Denmark. Joined that club and then another one was just Americans or people who like America. You don't have to be from America, but friends of the US and I joined that club. I think joining clubs was just a nice way to have activities on my schedule and little things I could go to and attend. I did some dinners and bar meetups and things like that and you just get to talk to people. A lot of people, some people you're like, wow, I don't think we're going to be good friends. And other people where you're like, oh, you're so cool and I just met some great people that way. I met a girl named Jen who's from San Diego. And through her, I met two other girls who've become really close friends of mine. So there's four Americans in our little circle, and we have a few other non-American friends, a Danish girl who comes to all of our events with us. She's an honorary Dane, and all of those girls will be at my wedding. They're some of my closest friends here in Denmark. So it's really important that you try and meet the locals too. That was important to me, that I become friends with my colleagues at work, and I've met some wonderful friends that way. I have two very close Danish friends and and then the American girls. So in the beginning I thought, oh I don't need to hang out with Americans that much, but it's actually been a huge help for me to have Americans who I can commiserate with and talk to and we talk about our our issues and the things that can like make us a little homesick or tired of Denmark. You just kind of get it out and then you move on and I love them for that. We just share, we talk about missing things like Sour Patch Kids and ridiculous Chipotle and then we can like laugh about it and then go off on our merry way and enjoy Copenhagen. So I think you just have to really be outgoing and I'm naturally an introvert so it was kind of hard for me to like you know join all these things and, and push myself but I also really enjoyed doing that at the same time. I knew that there was no other way. I wasn't going to make friends by just staying indoor and no one was going to knock on my door and say, hey, welcome to Denmark. Let me be your friend. That sounds like a great thing, but that's not the Danish way at all. I don't know if I've said this yet in a video, but I think the one overarching criticism Danes get accused of is not being super outgoing. They can be a bit reserved in general. The stereotypical Dane who is 35 from Kolling in Uland, and that person perhaps isn't a very gregarious, warm, open person who's like, let me make new friends. That person has his friends or her friends from when they were two or three and they've kept those friends and now they're an adult. Why would they need a new friend? I've actually talked to some of my Danish friends who, who say things like that, like, oh, I'm busy enough, I don't need new friends. And I would think, how do you not need new friends? Like, of course, there's always room for new friends. But here, they take their friendships very seriously, which I love and I respect, but it's serious in that there's not always room for new friends. So I don't know if that makes any sense. I'm not explaining it very well. But that is, like, the hardest part. I think a lot of foreigners here in Denmark talk about that. There was a girl who was in the international club. I never met her, but online she would talk about how she had a party. I think she was living in Horsens or Aarhus or something. She had a party and she made all this food and she invited friends from work and no one came. And I was like, it just broke my heart reading that. I couldn't believe that happened to her. But I don't know the backstory. I'm not saying that Danes don't show up for parties. I mean, that's so not fair or true, but I think it is hard to break through socially sometimes. So you really have to work at it. I've made some wonderful friends here and I've worked at it and they've worked at it too and they've welcomed me with open arms and they accept me for who I am, for being a crazy foreigner, for having wild ideas and opinions and sometimes I'll complain about their country in front of them. 
but they know at the end of the day that I love Denmark and that I'm telling them because I trust them and they know where I stand on things. So.